podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Thank you very much. This gives me precious five minutes for my extra five minutes for my talk. Um, so this, uh, I just wrote the references. This is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, this is this is for the physics. Well, physics in quotation marks, of course, in the sense like everything we do these days is physics <laughs> with quotation marks. And then there's a mathematical result, which um, was a series of mathematical results that uh, has been obtained in collaboration with Axel and uh, with Alex Feingold. Um, and this work is, so this is, this is, uh, related to what we call quantum cosmological billiards. So that's the first attempt to quantize the cosmological billiards. And this uh, is deals with uh, vile groups of certain hyperbolic Katsmudi algebras and shows that they can be reinterpreted or understood as generalized modular groups. This actually goes back to early work by uh, Igor Frankel and Alex Feingold who showed that if a certain rank three hyperbolic Katsmudi algebra, the wild group was just the usual uh, modular group, the even wild group. Uh, also, I should mention that there's a, because I'm going to talk about uh, quaternions and octonions, there's a very nice little book by um, John Conway. And, uh, Derek Smith. It's called On Quaternions and Octonions. And all the wisdom I'm going to give you about octonions, or at least 99% of it, uh, can be found in this book. It's a very thin book, but it has all the essential information. So my talk will uh, be divided in three parts. First of all, we have something that I would refer to as fun with octonions. I hope it will be fun. Uh, secondly, I will tell you about rings of integers, integers in, in the, these uh, division algebras. So quaternions, octonions, and so on, and their relation to certain uh, root lattices. And finally, I will apply this to uh, the problem of quantizing uh, cosmological billiards. Oops. So I'll start out very simply. You all know about uh, real and complex numbers. And, uh, and these are both uh, what's called division algebras, which means that they, uh, they, there is a norm, and that this norm or modulus satisfies this identity. For the complex numbers, this involves a two squares identity. That's high school or even kindergarten uh, arithmetic. But one important thing here is that, uh, which you derive from this, is that if the product uh, uh, is zero, then either one of these factors or both of them have, have to be zero. So that's a basic property of this. Now, Complex numbers were essentially developed by, I guess, invented and developed by Gauss. And this was at, in the early 19th century. And uh, people started asking themselves, are there generalization thereof? Are there hyper-complex systems? And they tried. Uh, for example, you know, by adding another imaginary unit to the uh, usual imaginary unit, and it didn't work out until Hamilton in, in 18, 1843 realized finally, and it struck him like lightning, 
that you, in order to make it work, you needed to introduce three imaginary units. And when he had this in inspiration on the spot, he uh, on the spot he carved these equations into there's a, there's, a, there's a bridge in Dublin, and he carved these equations into the bridge. And I think if you go there, I haven't seen it, although I come to Dublin quite often, but they now have a plaque commemorating this event. And this shows the following set of equations. We have three imaginary units. And they obey these relations, from which all others follow. It was soon noticed that uh, these, um, these uh, imaginary hypercomplex numbers, uh, there's one property that they don't satisfy anymore. And they, um, because unlike the complex and real numbers, they're no longer commutative, but they're non-commutative. So for example, it follows that I, the imaginary units anti-commute, and therefore it's non-commutative. So this is the quaternions, and we'll denote them by this symbol. Well, uh, Hamilton was so proud, he thought that this was the most important discover he, discovery he had ever made, and he spent the rest of his life sort of uh, uh, expanding on this and, uh, and uh, making propaganda for it. But at about the same time, there were then people, uh, Cayley and Graves, who asked themselves, can we push this further? And uh, it was soon after realized, yes, that this is possible. Um, and then you get to the so-called octonions. Uh, denoted like this. Now this is a system of hypercomplex numbers with seven imaginary units. And I will tell you in a moment how this comes about that these go from one to three to seven. And the next thing would be 15. So they have seven imaginary units uh, labeled, now designated by EJ, where J runs from one to seven. And uh, the multiplication rules are as follows, and I give you in the form which, in which they're most easily memorized. In the relation, well, first of all, we have this anti-commutation property, so that's the analog of this. Okay. And then the other multiplication rule is simply summarized as follows. If you multiply three of them, uh, in this, with this ordering of the indices, then you get uh, minus one. So that generalizes this. And the other thing you have to keep in mind is that in this relation you have to uh, uh, count the index modulo seven. So j is the same as j plus seven. So if this number exceeds seven, then you simply subtract uh, seven and then uh, you get the corresponding relations. So this, uh, so here, this looks exactly like this. So each of these triples will define a quaternionic subalgebra. So that would be expected to obey the same property as this. But uh, now comes another surprise, and it was also realized early on, soon after they were discovered. It was point pointed out that these octonions are well, the division algebra, maybe I should mention this before I go on, because you still have a, an analog of this relation. So if you define a, gen, a general octonion like uh, x like this, where you then simply sum from one to seven, x, j, e, j. Okay, any quaternion, uh, octonion can be represented like this. Then you define an, uh, complex conjugation simply by inverting the sign here, all the terms with imaginary units, where all these x uh, alpha are real numbers. So it's an eight-dimensional space of the real numbers. And then you define z times uh, <coughs> or the modulus squared will be z times 
bar, which is just some x alpha squared for this from <coughs> 0 to 7. Yes. Okay. That's a convention. You see, we look at the books, there are different conventions, but this with these conventions, it's easiest to memorize how, how the rules go. Uh, because here, first of all, I've told you uh, uh, that... So that it would be ej times ej plus 1 is equal to ej plus 2? Yeah. Okay. So it's like I, ij is equal to k, jk is equal to i. It's cyclically mm -hmm. symmetric. Uh, right away, it's J plus two instead of J plus three. Yes, that would be one convention, but then uh, structure constants would look uh, more complicated. You see, with this, it's very simple. It's just like I tell you. Now, it's, it's not so easy, but still true, that, uh, that this identity uh, holds for this, um, for this definition and with these multiplication rules. Um, that involves what's called an eight squares identity, which generalizes the one that you have for complex numbers, but that's a bit harder to, or more tedious to check. Now the thing is, you, of course, you have to check that this really defines, if you write this on the other side, a product, any product between any two given octonions, uh, you can convince yourself that actually with this um, periodicity, this is true. Any product is defined by these two rules. But the surprise is now that you lose associativity. And to do this, uh, to, to see this, you, you simply multiply two numbers or three of them, which are not from such a triplet. You see, each such, such triplet defines a quaternion uh, subalgebra. Now, but if you take, for example, E1 times E2 times E3, in this order, then uh, following this rule, this is E1 times E4. Uh, E1 times E2 is E4. So this is E4 times E3. And this is uh, minus, according to this other rule, minus E3 times E4. And this is equal to minus E6. OK? But if you now do it in the other way, multiply first this then this is equal to E1, and now this is E5. And uh, if you use this rule with a cyclic uh, permutation, we'll find that this is equal to plus E6. So any three units that are not from a quaternionic triplet will give the wrong sign. So that means uh, octonions are non-commutative. and non-associative, which means that they, um, they do not, in general, satisfy this rule. In general, this is different from A times B times C. So in physics, we're used to non-commutativity, but I can assure you that if you start calculating with these kinds of uh, objects that uh, uh, non-associativity is much worse than non-commutativity. There's still a little bit left uh, for the for the octonions, and it's it's a property called. Uh, let me see. I'll do it like this. It's a property called alternativity. And it means that if you simply take two. Uh, octonions, no matter which octonions, they always define a, uh, an associative subalgebra. So this is the same as this, and therefore we can write it without parentheses. So what's the general pattern behind this? I mean, how would you now go on? Because you could now ask, what, what is the, you know, can I further introduce further imaginary units? And you can uh, investigate this question by uh, means of what's called Cayley-Dixon doubling. Cayley-Dixon 
Dixon doubling. And this you do as follows. You start from one of these algebras, call them A. Okay, so this could be either real complex numbers, quaternions, and so on. And you now simply double by introducing yet another imaginary unit. Let's call it I. So we now simply define a new division algebra as the direct sum of this A plus I, where this is a new imaginary unit, not yet previously, not contained in the previous algebra, times A. Um, now, in this little booklet by Conway and Smith, uh, you will find the derived rule for doing multiplication because multiplication is to start with only defined within each division algebra. So you have to give some rules. And one of the rules is that you extend a complex conjugation. Uh, if you have, say, Z number Z, A plus IB, every element of this algebra can be represented like this. Then Z bar is equal to A bar minus I, B, but without the bar. And you also have to give a rule for the doubling, and this is this doubling rule, IB times C plus IB. Okay, I have to tell you how to multiply this. And you have to be a little careful because in general it's not associative. You have to be careful about how to put the parentheses. And the rule, this Cayley Dixon multiplication rule goes like this, that this is equal to A times C. So within each A, this is well defined. Uh, minus D B bar, that's one thing, plus I times uh, C B plus uh, A bar. Okay, so this is a little tricky because uh, it deals just A C, but when you multiply, say, this with this, this I factor has somehow to be carried through, and at the end of the calculation, it comes out that the order is inverted and B gets a bar. So this means that A prime is also a division algebra? No, 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 wait a second. That's the, that's the, so it's not the case. that's not the case. <laughs> because at each step, you lose something. As, and you can also see where the numbers come from, because if this thing has n, n imaginary units, n imaginary units, then you will get twice as many plus the i itself. So you go from n to 2n plus 1. So that shows you that as you go from complex numbers, it's 1. You go to 3. From quaternions, it's 3. You go to 7. So the next step, you would be led to what's called sedenions, and they would have 15 imaginary units. But if you use this rule, and also this definition, which still applies, then it turns out you lose again something. And this something uh, is the following. In fact, you now lose this property because uh, you can check with this rule that A plus IB times C plus IB. So you calculate the, the norm squared then this is equal to the norm of A plus IB squared times C plus IB squared. So far, so good. But now there comes an extra term, and this term is equal to 2 times real part. Well, real part is always any given octonia is just this piece. Of, and then it's D, to get this right, bar, a, C, B, where this thing here is the associator. We will write this here. Associator. Associator is like commutator, but A, B, C is defined as A times B, C minus A, B, 
C. So it's the mismatch in, or the measures the failure to associate. And now you see, and you can actually construct examples, that if, if you lose associativity, then you also lose the composition property. Yeah? So is uh, C plus IC mean associative without the complex numbers if you do this? Is it H or not? It is H. But H plus IH is not? Uh, it's an octonion. It's the octonion? But with this, with, this, with this tool, you have to do this properly. Mm -hmm. If you don't do it, then the thing is inconsistent. There's, there's only one way of doing it. This was actually investigated by uh, Hurwitz. It's called Hurwitz theorem. And Hurwitz noticed that if you now go from octonions to sedenions, where you would have 15 imaginary units, you can construct examples where this is zero, but neither of these is. And in the terms of this relation, you just have to pick this example in such a way that this associated term just compensates this. So the so the they're non associative. But if you now take the, um, um, if you take H plus IH, um, you violate um, the fact that you have a division algebra because of the non associativity of the opponents. Or, uh, uh, no, 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 no. Because you see, for an octonion, then each of these of is a quaternion. Which? And for the quaternion, this is zero. Oh, I see. Okay, so so it, just bad, it just works okay. for the quaternions. Okay. It, it, starts, the problem starts it, with the it starts as you go beyond the octonions. Okay. So it goes a little further as long as you keep, as, uh, this will be relevant later, as long as you keep this equal to zero, it's still valid. But in general, for sedenions, they're no longer, mm -hmm. and they no longer satisfy this property. They have what's called the zero divisors. And uh, you also lose this alternativity. So, that was part one. Uh, when did I start? Oh. So, I'll, I'll be a little brief on the integers. Now, the next thing I want to tell you is about integers in these division algebras. Now, uh, well, let's just start with, uh, with, uh, with the reals. Of course, uh, then we have the usual integers. And uh, what I want to tell you about is that these integers, they can be associated to certain root lattices. Now, he, this, this is very trivial, actually. It's just the root lattice of, of A1 or SL2. So that's not much to say. But let's look at complex numbers. Well, that's already less clear. I will not do this uh, the way mathematicians do. They define orders and uh, algebraic integers, blah, blah, blah. This is, this is a whole theory by itself. We'll just look at the ones that we're interested in. Well, here you have two kinds of integers. There are the Gaussian integers that simply consist of m plus n i with m n in the integers. So it's just a square lattice. That's the Gaussian integers. But there's another integer system, which is relevant here, and it's the Eisenstein integers, um, which consists of m plus uh, n times cube, cube root of unity, uh, again with mn in, in the integers. And the cube root of unity is, of course, uh, uh, minus 1 plus i square root 3 divided by 2. Okay, this is a lattice. And if you draw what the lattice is, you will recognize immediately something you've seen before. And that's just the root lattice and so on. Okay, that's the root lattice of uh, the algebra A2. Where the usually one normalizes the roots to length uh, two, here we normalize it to length one. Uh, and the important thing is that with this normalization, you have a lattice. Lattice is something that's closed under addition, but on top of this, we can also it's also, also closed under multiplication. If you multiply any uh, two numbers of this type 
you get another number which is of this type. And therefore, the root lattice of A2 is actually not just the lattice, but it's a ring of integers which allows for addition and multiplication. Uh, A1 squared or B2 uh, C2, yes. Actually, this is all, all uh, reviewed in our paper, so I'll just pick the things that are of most, most interesting. Yeah? It's very specific. It doesn't work. I mean, it's not true that every Lie algebra admits this kind of, or the root lattice admits this kind of uh, ring-like structure. Well, you will see what uh, we do. <coughs> because now it gets more interesting with the quaternions. Of course, we have something called, well, the obvious thing is, of course, uh, m0 plus m1 i plus m2 j plus m3k. Okay? And this is what's called the Lipschitz integers. And they're obviously closed, just like the Gaussian. But in fact, there's something more intricate. Well, here, m, m, j are all integer. But there's something called the Hurwitz integers, uh, which is the same, except that now you take m to be integer or all or half integer, all of them. Uh, this is possible, and you can check for yourself with these rules that if you put one halves, then in principle you might be afraid that uh, you get one quarters, one eighth, and then it would no longer be uh, a discrete, uh, well, this kind of ring that we want, or uh, root lattice. But in fact, you can check that the one, one halves, it all works out nicely. And again, um, They're either all integer or all half integer. Because the norm has to be in an integer. And this works because four times a quarter is uh, one. Okay? Now again, but this is kind of harder to see, this, this is again a root lattice of a Lie algebra. And that root lattice is the root lattice of D4 or O8. Yes. So, uh, so this the surprising result is that uh, the root lattice of SO8, D4, can be endowed with the structure of a ring in the sense that the, the root lattice is really a ring of integers. And in this ring, the units, units are the elements that have an inverse, are precisely the roots, the elements that can be inverted within the ring. Okay? So you, but you, now you see that... Uh, um, L you could understand as uh, P plus IP. Yes, but... Uh, but you cannot have P plus I. Uh, you mean it apply the doubling procedure yeah. to this? Yeah. Uh, that would lead to this, I guess. Well, not really. Well, that's also, you can sort of try to embed this. That's. But let's not get into this, because I, I'm, there's a yet more interesting case. Because here you see that this is a commutative and associative ring of integers. This now is a non-commutative, but still associative ring of integers. Now, what about E8? Uh, it's not E8. Well, I'm already uh, jumping ahead. What about the octonions? Now, here it's more tricky. And in fact, you can read about this in this book. Uh, of course, the integers within these octonions that we're talking about should contain the previous set of integers. So the first thing you might try is that to define a ring of integers by taking all quaternionic uh, triplets, subsets, like you do for the Hurwitz integers, and their complements within uh, the octonions. With integer or half-integer coefficients. Uh, 
This was actually proposed by a German mathematician, it's not well known, his name was Kilmse, and, uh, but then it turned out that he had made a mistake. And in this book, it's referred to as Kilmse's mistake because it's such an obvious mistake and then I think everyone will make it bef who first thinks about this problem. Uh, it turns out that this way of doing it, you get integers, but when you multiply them, it's not a closed system. So that doesn't work. And this was only a remedy actually by, amongst others, Coxeter in 1946. This is explained in our paper how to do this. You have to do invert uh, or interchange the unit with one of the, the one with one of the imaginary units. And then you get a closed system and it's uh, called Octavians. This is so-called Octavians. Well, and uh, you can already guess, I actually already betrayed the result. Uh, what this is going to be. This is going to be the root lattice of uh, E8. So in other words, the E8 root lattice can be endowed with a structure of a ring, which is however no longer commutative and no longer associative. It is non-commutative, non-associative ring of integers in the octonions. And I'll just give you the, uh, a certain basis for this uh, because one can also define scalar product, etc. Um, let me just give you the um, a basis for this. So what you do is you define a basis in terms of the E A Dimkin diagram. Um, And then you give like, uh, for example, this one here, let me call it epsilon because this will appear, reappear later. This is like one half, uh, one minus E1 minus E2 minus E6, uh, alpha two or epsilon two is like uh, E1 and so on. Uh, you can find this in our paper or in the book if you like. So this would be, epsilon 2 would be here, and so on. There are all such integer or half integer combinations of, of the e's and, the, and 1. And the claim is that, first of all, the scalar products of these things will be such that you reproduce this uh, Dinkin diagram, or the Cartan matrix. So the Cartan matrix is really Aij, it's essentially Ei times Ej plus complex conjugate times E, okay, or maybe with a minus sign. Um, and this will reproduce the E8 Cartan matrix. Uh, and then the claim is that the, it's an integer ring. The units in this ring, there are precisely 240 units in this ring, and they're precisely the roots of uh, the E8 Lie algebra. So, so much for uh, connections with, uh, with the um, root lattices. And there, there are a few, few other cases that are discussed in our paper. Uh, it's also non-simply laced uh, Lie algebras, but I've just given here the, the simplest examples. And the main result of, our, of this analysis is, is actually that the Weyl groups or certain Weyl groups can be related, for these Lie groups, can be related to modular groups, generalized modular groups over these integers. But uh, I will show this explicitly in the last part of the talk. Let me maybe erase this. So now we're going to change gears and go back to physics. And at the end of the day, I hope you will see the connection of what this has to do with cosmological billiards and um, and quantum chaos. No.
because then you no longer get a ring because a ring, uh, I think one of the definitions of a ring is that it shouldn't have zero divisors. At least that's the standard definition of what the ring is. Um. Uh, the leech lattice, yes, but that, um, well, you see, the thing is, uh, you have the lattice, there are lots of lattices, but to, to, to define a multiplication on the lattice elements, which close and satisfy a certain number of properties, in particular this uh, zero divisor property, that in general will not work. It just works for these exceptional cases. So now we go back to what I started telling you about uh, yesterday. So now it's like a different talk, but uh, I hope it will come together at the end. Uh, yesterday I told you that when analyzing Einstein's equations near the singularity, one proceeds from a metric ansatz, which in the simplest case is essentially n squared times t, t squared. So you choose a certain gauge for this which is such that this coordinate then runs from zero to infinity as you move towards the singularity, plus, and then it's summed e to the two theta a times, uh, well, let me just write dx a squared, where this runs from one to d, where d labels the number of spatial dimensions. So this is the basic ansatz that goes into BKL analysis, and here these are the scale uh, factors which uh, effectively, I mean, where effectively the dynamics takes place. There are other degrees of freedom here, off diagonal, et cetera, which uh, are not essential, which, which don't behave in a very interesting way as you approach the singularity. Now, if you substitute this into the Einstein-Hilbert action, then you get an effective uh, Lagrangian. So Lagrangian is effective if effectively proportional to, and let me write this as, uh, well, there's a, a certain lapse function which, which is constructed out of this and out of this. Never mind what it is, because we're going to choose the gauge equal one, any little n equals one, and then ab from one to d, g ab, d da dot a, d da b dot, where well, this is the so-called De Witt metric, and uh, if you write it out explicitly what it is, it's a uh, sum of beta a dot squared minus sum beta a dot, and then the whole thing squared. So this is what comes out of the Einstein action. Uh, this is a specialization of the so-called De Witt metric to this mini superspace ansatz. Well, the full Lagrangian is, of course, uh, uh, this. It gets modified by a potential involving walls. But uh, so, so the full Lagrangian is not just this. So this is 0. So Lf is equal to Lf0, which is just this kinetic term plus a certain effective potential, which depends on the beta. Now, uh, the first thing I should say that this, this metric, and this is already what I said yesterday, this is a Lorentzian metric. It has signature, this has signature um, minus plus plus. Okay, uh, so that's something that's induced from the Einstein action. It's, it's to do with the fact that Einstein action is unbounded from uh, below. And secondly, it has this peculiar form. And from this, you, if you for the moment ignore this term, this simply tells you that there are two sets, two equations of motion, namely uh, one of them. So if you do the equations of motion, that tells you that beta of A of t is uh, beta a zero plus, let's say, v a times t. So it's just a linear straight motion. And uh, 
Furthermore, because you have this lapse, one has a constraint, less just like an ordinary uh, general relativity. So that tells us that, um, well, really VA, VA with respect to this Lorentz symmetric has to be zero. So this is a linear motion in the space of scale factors. And furthermore, it, it obeys this dispersion relation. So it's like a massless relativistic, well, relativistic uh, particle. In fact, this is just the Cosmos solution because this, this, this is just the Cosmos the Cosmo condition. If you solve Einstein's equations with this kind of ansatz, you will find a condition which is just the Cosmos condition for, the, for these uh, exponential coefficients. Now, the modification or the BKL analysis shows you how to calculate this. Now this is, we start with Einstein's equations. This is a very complicated uh, sum of terms, very hard to analyze. But the great thing about the BKL analysis is that in the limit towards the singularities becomes very simple. Generally, here you have a set of TODA terms, but actually in the limit, this becomes just a system of walls. And then you have the picture which I drew yesterday. So in this beta space, one has a light cone which is like this. And then, um, uh, so the time goes uh, this way. Um, and then the solution here is simply a straight motion in this, uh, in this beta space. So we we'll just draw a null line in the space. But this modification inserts walls on which this particle reflects. And the set of dominant walls defines what, what's called the chamber here. So you, you take these walls, you intersect them, and then they partition this light cone into uh, little wedges, which look like this. Okay. And then in this picture, as you go towards the singularity, the particle moves on a null line. It bounces off this wall, goes up, again bounces off this wall, and does so an infinite number of times. And that this, in this description is precisely what BKL referred to as chaotic oscillations of the metric. It just means that this scale factor jumps back and forth and is reflected an infinite time, number of times before you reach the singularity. This is also the advantage of choosing coordinates such that a uh, singularity appears at plus infinity. If you did it otherwise, with a finite interval, it would look very complicated. Yeah, singular simply means that the betas generally go to infinity. Because this means that the scale factor in this metric ansatz, this becomes zero. And if you calculate the curvature, the Riemann tensor, etc., you will really see that it diverges uh, as t goes to infinity. So now I, I will introduce, for the quantization, I will introduce a slightly new definition. New You mean isotropic? Yeah, isotropic. No, no, here it's very important that you have an isotropic because this is where the chaos happens. Right, okay. It means well, isotropic nothing would happen, right? Well, that, then uh, you wouldn't see any of this, I guess. No, that, I mean, the really interesting thing is that, that you have an isotropy and you have an oscillations between infinite number of oscillations. It, it just means, physically speaking, I mean, this tells you how you stretch yeah. or squashed, but you it's that's squashed and stretched in different directions. Yeah. So singularity is a key to yes, infinity. In the other direction, does the space become isotropic related to the Earth's position? Uh, and do you gain isotropic so it's an isotropic fixed point? In well, that was, that, was, that was the hope uh, that Misner and these people had. But the thing is, you see, this, this approximation becomes good, or it becomes better as you go up here. As you go down here, it becomes where it essentially breaks down. So you cannot extrapolate this picture too far down. It's really, truly valid only as you move up. So only two for a big T, so for a large time. So I mean, it's, it, it is mixed master thing is, it would look like the perfect homogenizer of our universe. But unfortunately, it goes in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to come out of it. 
And uh, so. Yeah, because usually that's also true. If you look at whenever you have a contracting universe, yes. um, you can think from the point of view of other dimensions. It's like a negative friction. Yes. So it's always unstable with respect to particle creation. So you always produce graviton. That's yeah, but this is already quantum aspect. No, in a classical way, you see that there is a square. I mean, gravity is a Yeah, there's exponential instability. So probably it relates to that. Well, anyway, the claim is that this, 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 only, this approximation holds only very close to the... Uh, essentially, it requires that the beta has become infinity. Then it becomes better and better and better. But as you go away from the singularity, it eventually breaks down. Which is quite, of course a bit unfortunate because as we go into the singularity, we know that the theory is not true anymore. It has to be replaced by something else. But as we go out of it, the approximation breaks down. So that's uh, maybe the reason that this has not had so many, many practical applications. But now we're going to do something else. We're going to, for the description of this motion, we're going to project the motion onto unit hyperbolic in this forward light curve. And this means re uh, rewriting beta as a factor of rho times omega a, where g a b, omega a, omega b is equal to minus 1. So this is parameterized in terms of uh, d. So this is d minus 1, spatial number of dimensions minus 1 uh, coordinates that coordinates this uh, hyperboloid. And the singularity happens as you take rho to infinity. OK, now for the quantum theory. But this is just a good old mini superspace approximation, but now when you look at the books, mini superspace approximation is a standard thing in cosmology, quantum cosmology. But most of the time, people take the, the isotropic ansatz with maybe some matter fields and so on. That's what people do in, in inflationary cosmology, inflationary quantum cosmology. So uh, here, it's, uh, it's very important that we keep this an isotropy because there we will see uh, the structure of uh, all these things. Now, it's, it's very easy this to go pass through Hamiltonian description because, uh, um, well, it's just standard quantization of a relativistic particle. So we have a Hamiltonian constraint. Well, in first approach, well, that's the thing. This would be completely homogeneous. Here you take into account a certain control approximation, inhomogeneities, matter degrees of freedom, and so on. The, the main statement of BKL is that in this limit, the inhomogeneities are realized or effectively realized by this effective potential. You can think of it, it's just like an analogy in high energy physics when you integrate out massive degrees of freedom and then you end up with a low energy effective potential. And this, this is in a similar spirit, although this is classical. Anyway, we now have a Hamiltonian constraint, pi A, pi B. And as you can see, this is just a good old Klein-Gordon equation for the wave function of the universe. And uh, let me just write this, this function in, in these new coordinates. And then the operator takes the following form, d by d rho, uh, rho d to the minus 1, d by d rho, plus uh, rho to the minus 1. Uh, and this stands for Laplace Beltrami. Uh, so this, so you see that this rho really effectively acts like a time coordinate. This is what people do in canonical gravity. There is no time, but therefore you operationally define time in terms of one of the variables. And this is this variable has been extracted from the scale factors in this particular way. There's a certain dimension dependence. 
And then this piece, if you like that, so that's the radial piece or time-like piece. And this is the uh, uh, angular piece, if you like, that the part of this uh, Klein-Gordon operator that lives on this um, hyperboloid. And when you work it out, it's actually the laplace Beltrami operator on this, on this unit hyperboloid. Uh, well, you can extract it from here, yes, here, yeah. I mean, this shows you that you can essentially identify rho with, uh, with T. Uh, and let me emphasize once more what's important here is that the wheeler de Witt equation has this indefinite signature in it, which is inherited from the indefiniteness of the Einstein action. And this is very important here because this turns this into a wave equation. It's not a Laplace equation, it's a wave equation for these metric uh, degrees of freedom. Okay? So, uh, well, you can now try to, uh, well, the thing is now, uh, so far it's, it's just the ordinary um, Klein-Gordon equation, but now at this point come, now how do I incorporate the this, this BKL uh, potential into it, uh, at least in this uh, very same approximation. Now I told you that um, that the uh, potential is characterized in terms of walls that insert a chamber into this forward light cone. So, and as I also told you yesterday, is that this chamber here this chamber here is just the Weyl chamber of a certain series, Weyl chamber of some uh, Katz-Moody algebra, which is in the case of M series, just uh, E10. So how do you now translate uh, this property into property of, of a requirement on the wave function? Now this is just like quantizing the a free particle in quantum mechanics in, in a potential well where the potential uh, walls are infinitely high. So you would just impose uh, directly boundary conditions. So it simply means that you have to uh, impose such boundary conditions. And furthermore, because these reflections, which the classical, this cla uh, particle undergoes classically, on nothing but uh, while reflections, you will now require that your uh, wave function, so the wave function uh, has, to, has to satisfy uh, Wheeler de Witt equation. So it's, let's call it psi of beta. Um, and this has to satisfy, well, first of all, it has to satisfy H. Uh, h of psi of beta equal to zero. That's just the wheeler de Witt equation. But secondly, and now this is where the group theory in the Lie algebra comes into the picture. It also has to satisfy a certain boundary condition, or otherwise it has to satisfy, it has to be invariant under these uh, reflections. That means precisely the reflections that correspond to the Weil group of E10. So if you have a, such a chamber, it's defined by walls. The walls are the walls that are orthogonal to simple roots of the Lie algebra. And the reflections on these roots generates what's called the Weil group. So on top of this, this wave function must satisfy uh, that if you perform such a Weil reflection on the betas in this space, let me call, just, uh, we'll just refer to the fundamental reflections because if you keep iterating it, this will generate the whole wild group. You will require that this is equal to a plus or minus psi of beta. There are actually two signs here because in quantum mechanics we know that uh, the things, uh, we always take products of such wave functions. So you have both uh, possibilities. And you can check that uh, in terms of the boundary conditions, the uh, minus sign 
corresponds to uh, directly boundary conditions and the plus sign to Neumann boundary conditions. Okay. So you can also check because the vital reflections leave invariant this row. This really means that uh, psi of uh, rho, and uh, let me now write uh, a z. This uh, z here, that's d minus 1 variables. So this should be invariant under plus or minus. Psi of rho stays the same. But here we have a sort of induced action of, of the vital reflections on the on Z. Let me clean this blackboard, or maybe the one up there. Um, so this is this is how uh, how the um, th this group theory, this E10, etc., which we don't understand very much, but we sort of think we know what the Weil group is. These arithmetic properties translate down or filter down to in this mini superspace approximation, even with, without knowing the full theory, we see a trace of this E10 symmetry in terms of via this, uh, um, this invariance property under wide reflections. So let's now see how this is realized. Because uh, one can now, just like for Schrödinger theory of hydrogen atom or similar such problems, you can now make a product ansatz. Uh, so you write psi of rho and z. You make an ansatz like you do in Schrödinger theory uh, of rho times f uh, of z. And then you can easily check that the problem becomes one of diagonalizing this operator. So you just look for uh, functions L of B um, that are eigen or diagonalized by this operator. Well, depend on conventions. And let me put plus. Um, maybe I should put a minus, but well, maybe yes, I should. F of C. So we require, so this, this is easy to solve for if you substitute in the equation above. Uh, this is now a problem of finding eigenmodes on, well, what is this Z? Z is a coordinate on the, on the it's a coordinate on, the, on this unit hyperboloid, but it turns out that the, there's an isometric map, mapping of the unit hyperboloid onto the uh, Poincaré upper half plane. Uh, and this works as follows. We define a generalized upper half plane. Uh, can you give me another five minutes or so? Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll try to get to the point as quickly as possible. Z, where these, this is U plus IV, and now generalized means that the U is now taken to be in any of the division algebras, whereas the V we still take to be positive. And this I is the imaginary unit not contained here, so it's a new thing. So if this is octonionic, then this is slightly sedenionic. So uh, the case of interest is uh, M theory. So there we have 10 spatial dimensions. After this projection, it becomes nine dimensional. And the nine is eight plus one. So for M theory, we're talking uh, about the octonionic upper half plane. OK, and then now the next thing is to work out what this is, because this is the fundamental Weil reflections of E10, but how do they act on this upper half plane? And uh, this can be done, and uh, I'll just show you how it goes, and then you will certainly recognize what's happening. It turns out that for E, 
E10 mile group, uh, we have the following action. Uh, so here we would have to add two more nodes uh, labeled one and minus one. So then we have the following induced action of these while transformations on the upper half plane. So W of minus one on Z is equal. And you notice that all these operations are well defined even for if you take these things to be octonions. So first of all, this is equal to uh, 1 over z bar. OK. W0 of z is simply uh, minus z bar plus 1. And now for the other nodes, this is now where I now come back to what I told you at the, fir in the first part of the lecture. This is an octonion. And I'll simply define this to be epsilon, well, it just comes out to be this way, epsilon, OK? So what is this? Here you take, well, these are operations that you've seen before from modular groups. This uh, is, you simply multiply, you take the, the, the simple roots from this diagram, normalized to unity, and simply perform this transformation. And you notice, because of alternativity, I can, don't have to specify parentheses or anything. You can, is, well, you can sort of specialize this to the even while group, because you may say, well, maybe this z bar is kind of strange. But that's only the odd part of the while group. If you now go to the even while group, you compose this with uh, another reflection, and then you get the following set of transformations. And now I'm sure you will recognize this for what it is. Uh, w0 of z is uh, z plus 1. And wj of z is uh, epsilon j z epsilon j. So what you see here? Well, this, of course, you all know, because this is just the, the, the statement that, uh, well, these two transformations generalize, generalize the, or generate the modular group. And the claim is now that these transformations here uh, generate, uh, well, a generalized modular group, which we call a PL, uh, a PSL2 over the Octavians, and the claim is that, oh, what you see here is that this modular group is just the same as the even while group of E10. But actually, this was the result of the, this paper with Alex Feingold. So this, you see, this is a true generalization because if you did this for just ordinary gravity in four dimensions, you'd also get a hyperbolic Katz-Moody algebra, namely this feingold frankel algebra. And then this group would just be the ordinary, uh, uh, ordinary modular group. Uh, here, it's, it's more complicated. But uh, in fact, this has not been explored. There's no, there are no books on this. Uh, this needs to be developed. So that means the statement now is that we have the mini superspace approximation. We've augmented it with this. Uh, uh, this knowledge coming from E10 and the BKL analysis. And the main claim statement is now that the wave function of the universe in this mini superspace approximation has to be, on the one hand, characterized by such eigenfunctions of the Laplacian on the upper half plane. And at the same time, it has to be uh, invariant under this group. And it's therefore what's called a mass waveform. or which means an automorphic, automorphic form. So it's automorphic in this sense, but it's not holomorphic. It's, it's generalized automorphic. And uh, eigenfunction of uh, uh, Laplace Beltrami operator on the generalized upper half plane. 
So, uh, in fact, these uh, kind of automorphic forms I th are also used in recent analysis by Michael, Michael Green and others of non perturbative effects. Uh, but, but as you can see, this is, this is a somewhat different kind of uh, uh, automorphic form or mass uh, waveform. Well, uh, the thing is, this, unlike the colomorphic Eisenstein series and so on, these functions cannot be uh, constructed as explicitly. They have to be analyzed numerically. There's a lot of work on... P For SL2Z, there's a lot of numerical analysis. Well, there are two kinds. Maybe I can still say this. Uh, this is actually a very, very tricky theory because um, uh, you have... In this case, uh, you have, of course, discrete eigenvalues. But when you analyze this, there's also this uh, Neumann boundary condition. And there you can construct these analogs of the Eisenstein series, but non-holomorphic Eisenstein series. And in fact, you, you can see that similar things uh, can be constructed for, for this. And uh, there you have the interesting case that uh, here you have a purely discrete spectrum. Here you have a continuous spectrum that's given by the Eisenstein series function, but when, within the continuum you have an infinite number of discrete eigenvalues, which must be de determined uh, numerically. So uh, to conclude, uh, this, is, this is what comes out very naturally out of this analysis. It tells you that for M theory, even in this mini superspace approximation, you have to uh, I mean, the solutions of the wheeler de Witt equation lead you to this uh, automorphic theory, which is mostly unexplored, as I said. We're at the moment we're working on this, but uh, progress is somewhat slow. Uh, so you see that uh, although mini superspace is mini superspace, it's certainly not the final answer to our questions, that even here, the the, the group theory properties, the Lie algebra properties of the higher dimensional theory filter through uh, and impose certain consistency conditions on these uh, mini superspace uh, wave functions. I think I should stop here. Maybe we have a few more questions. Uh, we have also done this for uh, the supersymmetric theory. Um, uh, well, there are various other things I could, could say. But the important message which I want you to carry home is that uh, for M theory, you have to invent a new kind of uh, automorphic, automorphic uh, forms that is, in fact, a very tricky generalization of this usual modular group. Thank you. Yes, that should be clear. I, would like, I, mean, I, I cannot tell you what they are. You can't have to be. But with a finite amount of work, I should be able to figure it out. You see, I'm sort of extremist. I'm either no symmetry at all or every possible symmetry that I can think of. The same of the upper half bit, is it constructed according to the k symmetry process or not? Well, it's, the, the thing is, the, the interesting observation here is that if you do it like this, where this is an octonion, then this, this combination, if this this looks like you move a little bit into the selenium because you introduce an eighth imaginary unit. But precisely for this kind of numbers, the, the, this, this uh, division algebra property still holds. So if you multiply two of them, then the product of the norm is uh, uh, the product of the norms is still like the norm of the norm of the product. So if you would allow b equal to zero, uh, b can also be zero, then you would violate. Uh, well, v equals zero is like the boundary of the upper half plane. This is where these functions are expected to have cast. Yeah. So, um, so coming back to this, um, uh, Now, the thing is that those instabilities are for the wavelengths which are for 
worker of Visa, Visa.org, or Visa, typically. Um, now, and this tells you that when Visa.org or Visa exceeds one, you, you are in conflict with the, because you know that sort of the whole picture breaks down, because the, 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 the particles that, are, that you produce, those are particles with the wavelength, with the momenta higher than the plus length, Planck plan scale, which means that they stop to be particles, they become, the only interpretation you can give to them, they themselves become independent objects, they become black holes. Yeah. But their size is bigger than the size, your space now. And so that's probably the way here it tells us that the, the, the singularity is, is, is fictitious. It, it, it's, it's a product, it, it, the singularity is- You would like to propose the, the, the mechanism to resolve singularity. No, certainly we, we, I mean, that's a separate comment, but we, are, we, we believe that that's the case. That, that the single, so in general, these singularities are artifacts of the approximation and they cannot be pro proved in principle. But what I, my question was, can, can you use your precisely this powerful symmetry argument to sort of trace this uh, explicitly? Uh, no, not really, I think, because, you know, because I think, you know, I would have to understand how to take into account um, in a better way than I've been doing here, take into account the inhomogeneities, the switch on space, because this is basically the mini superspace approximation. Right. Right. So, uh, but it's not quite the mini superspace approximation because it gets amended by this uh, effective potential. Yeah. And all I've been saying is that if you just look at this, I'm not saying that this is the real theory. In fact, I think. You know, you could argue that, uh, well, certainly in the quantum theory, uh, this, this will not be uh, good enough. So all I'm saying is that uh, this is just a, a first step towards analyzing the properties of the wave function. The final wave function I would have would expect to be to involve the full intent because this this is just. Uh, I mean, we're still talking about the Cartan subalgebra, which is almost like nothing within this. Uh, huge algebra. And before I would make any such comments on this, on, on, on the issues raised by you, I would like to understand how to incorporate this. Because one equation which I also had on the blackboard yesterday is that naively you would think, because of this PKL decoupling, as you go to the singularity, that the full wave function of the theory should become more and more, because of the spatial decoupling, like an ultra local product psi of uh, x of well, now you have such a thing at each uh, spatial point. So at each you have a continuous product of such automorphic uh, things, but but this this is of course uh, ill defined as it stands. I don't know how to define it. So the, the, the dream, or the goal is really to replace this uh, wave function this formal ultra-local product by um, something involving the, the 10 degrees of freedom. And I wish I knew how to do that. But, uh, just, uh, so you can still, in the evening, just take this, this theory and formulate it. You mean the E10 model? Or the main three in four dimensions. Then you may make it more certain. Uh, or arbitrary dots. Or arbitrary dots, yeah. Well, do you mean just pure gravity? Yeah. <coughs> well, as I said, for, for pure gravity, this is, this, this is to a known. Uh, well, but that have a mathematical theory because there's something, you know, that these automorphic forms are well studied for PSL. There are books about this. So by still recommending that the singularity equation is the exact position before. Yes, but the, the thing is, I don't know because this this is this is sort of intuition, physics intuition, yeah. uh, because you think that it should become better and better, but well, it's actually becoming more and more ill-defined as you go towards the singularity. So I would have to look at the E10 with equation, but we also know that this equation will not just have to satisfy generalized Euler width but also a set of generalized constraints which we don't understand. So it, it, I don't even know what the final form of this is going to be. Yeah, I think we have 
think I think there are no more questions. So I'd like to thank you for this talk today, of course, also for the interesting series of talks. Thank you.